Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, teachers and students. Welcome to this session, which is under the Distinguished Speaker Webinar Series on Special and Inclusive Education, organized by the Department of Education of the University of Nicosia, Cyprus. The free webinar series take place online between September uh, 2021 and June 2022. They provide access to leading scholars in special and inclusive education all over the world and a unique opportunity for all of us to be informed about current debates and learn more about new methodologies, ideas and practices in the field of special and inclusive education. The webinars also provide the opportunity to interact with the invited speakers through a synchronous open discussion through YouTube and Facebook chat. So please do use this opportunity to pose any question you might have. If you have questions along the way, please do share them and we will be able to address them at the end. Now, I'd like kindly to introduce today's speaker. Today, we have the greatest pleasure to have with us an internationally well-known scholar and deep expert in the field of learning differences difficulties, Dr. Gavit Reed. Dr. Gavit Reed has kindly invited by the University of Nicosia Department of Education to give us a very interesting speech on the following topic, learning differences and inclusion, meeting the needs of all. Let me now read a brief CV of Dr. Gavit Reed. Dr. Gavit Reed is an international psychologist and author. He was formerly a classroom teacher for 10 years and university lecturer for 16 years, uh, senior lecturer. He was a senior lecturer at Moray House School of Education, University of Edinburgh from 1991 to 2007, where he wrote, it's very interesting this, the first master's course in dyslexia in the UK in 1993. He has written 40 books in the field of dyslexia, learning skills and motivation. His books have been translated into seven, in, uh, into seven languages, the Greek included, and uh, some are in third, fourth, and fifth editions. He lectures worldwide and uh, has regular international consultancies. Dr. Reed is chair of the British Dyslexia Association Accreditation Board and a regular speaker at the International Dyslexia Association conferences in the USA. He has previously held extended seminars and courses in Singapore, as well as in UK, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Dubai, Kuwait, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Poland, Czech Republic, Switzerland, Germany, Slovakia, Hungary, Cyprus, Greece, and Canada. He has been involved in a number of research programs and consultancies focusing on dyslexia, learning skills, teacher education, and assessment. He has sat on government panels on assessment and dyslexia. He has also been and changed the United Nations projects as a learning differences expert and has appeared on a number of radio and television programs on dyslexia worldwide, including Dubai, Kuwait, Australia, UK, Hong Kong, uh, Gibraltar, New Zealand, and Singapore. Dr. Reen has lectured to thousands, to thousands of professionals and parents in over 
80 countries. He is passionate about helping to achieve equal opportunities for those with dyslexia and other learning differences, and uh, is a strong advocate of the strengths and positive aspects of dyslexia and learning differences. Uh, his website uh, is www.drgavinreed.com. Before giving the floor to Dr. Uh, Gavin Reed, let me note that I had a unique opportunity to know personally him. Since 2004, I visited and I am uh, met him at the University of Edinburgh, and then I cooperated with him at the University of Ioana, Greece, in the context of a postgraduate program on dyslexia. Uh, he held seminars in one of the interesting books and uh, translated in one of uh, in Greek to Greek uh, in one of the interesting books, namely Learning Styles and Inclusion. Let me now give the floor to Dr. Gavit Reed. Hello, Dr. Gavit Reed. We are here. Thank you, and um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm assuming you can all hear me all right. Um, I'm, it's now morning at the moment. It's, um, I'm in Vancouver in Canada, and it's just past 7, 7 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so it may be afternoon where you are, or perhaps even evening, but it's this morning here. Um, I, I want to share my slides now. Um, so I will, do I, can you see that now? Okay, this is the first screen. You got this. You can see the slide. The first slide. Excellent. Good. Well, right. Welcome again. Um, as I was saying, I'm in Vancouver, in Western Canada, oh, God. and I appreciate that the audience is quite international. It's morning time here, so uh, and it may be where you are. So I'm going to talk about learning differences. And I say learning differences because you know that includes certainly dyslexia and dyspraxia and ADHD and dyscalculia, but it doesn't matter what label you use, I would see it as really being a difference. I know it's for many people it's a difficulty, and for some it's even a deficit, but or a disability. But I would see it as a difference. It's a difference in how these children or adults process information and how they how they come to terms with the whole learning paradigm, how they learn uh, despite having some significant issues with reading or spelling or writing. So that's gonna be my theme is learning differences. And the other theme is inclusion. And it's always been my view that children with dyslexia or whatever, or um, attention difficulties should be and need to be included in the mainstream school. Um, I know there are special programs, uh, even special teachers and, and special schools that can accommodate those challenges. But essentially, it would be the ideal would be to get teachers in mainstream trained, so they've got both social inclusion and educational inclusion as well. So that's going to be the second theme of my talk. That's the two main themes. So I'm going to start the slideshow now. Um, and I'll just move on, and that's the welcome again. This is a, the scene where I am at the moment. It's not quite as bright as that. This was yesterday, and that's sunset, and this is where I, I live at the top of a hill, and I'm looking down, and the background there um, is Vancouver. Uh, that's the skyline of Vancouver there. It's quite pretty, in fact. It's very pretty for those who have been here. But I actually come, you may have noticed by my accent, that I actually come from Edinburgh in Scotland. And that's very pretty also and very old. And that's a scene from Edinburgh. And that's Edinburgh. That's probably why I'm in Vancouver now, because this is Edinburgh in a bleak morning. That's the Royal Mile, which is beautiful in the summertime and in the wintertime too. Um, but why I'm showing you slides in Edinburgh, I want to start my talk by looking at something in Edinburgh specifically, and that's this gallery of modern art. And that's a beautiful gallery, and it's got 
two signs outside those two galleries that are joined together by just by a simple road um, and a path. One of the galleries, which I'll show you now, is this one here. And at night time, in fact, daytime, it's all the time, it's got that lit up. Everything is going to be all right. And that's lit up all the time. And I, when I lived in Edinburgh, I used to pass it every day because I lived quite near the gallery. And I used to think, wow, that's what I should be saying to parents and to teachers and, of course, to children and adults with dyslexia. That I should be saying, look, I know you've got these challenges and you've got difficulty in school and you've got all these other issues, but you know, everything will be all right. There's plenty, there is a, there's a lot of sport, there's a lot of new programs, a lot of ideas, uh, good teaching skills, and you are a good learner. So everything at the end of the day will be all right. And that's what I did say. And I, I found that quite inspiring to see that sign. However, there is another art gallery across the road, as I mentioned, and that has also got a sign uh, which struck with me when I read it, and that is this one here. There'll be no miracles here. That's across the, the road. And that's what I always say to parents and to children. Look, don't expect miracles. It's not going to, you're not going to suddenly become a, a fluent reader overnight. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience, and it's good, like everything else, it'll take some hard work. And so I thought these two comments, like everything's going to be all right, is inspiring, and there'll, no, there'll be no miracles here is realistic. And that is exactly what, how we need to deal with dyslexia and inclusion. I think it's inspiring to feel that a child with dyslexia could have so many challenges, but still be fully included in the mainstream school, both socially, emotionally, and educationally. And at the same time, we've got to be realistic that there will be hurdles to overcome. It may not be successful all the time. It may not be successful to begin with. It may take some time. So there'll be no miracles. There's no magic cure, but there are interventions and there are strategies. And that's what I'm hoping to uh, speak to you this evening or this morning about. Okay, so I want to move on now. And that's um, what my talk is going to be basically about. Um, understanding learning differences. That's the first thing I want to speak about, is, which I will in a few minutes. Just what is what do we mean by learning differences? What do we mean by dyslexia? Uh, I'm sure people have got different views and different perceptions of dyslexia. Um, how could we uh, set appropriate challenges to try to extend the learning? It's too easy to say, oh, they're managing fine, they're doing well, they're, they're coping. But some children with dyslexia could be high achievers. Not all, but some can be gifted learners, in fact. So we've got to make sure that the challenges and the tasks that we set for them are appropriate and, if necessary, can stretch an extent of learning. We need to support learners to overcome any potential barriers. Now, it could be all sorts of barriers. I mentioned um, those social barriers, emotional barriers, educational barriers, um, sometimes even a barrier just going to school because some of them may not want to go to school. <laughs> so there's all these barriers. And, that's the sort of thing, that would be targets that one could look at and see how we could put in some steps to see if we could overcome those barriers. And there's also effective learning and trying to help to equip the learning, the learner, trying to help him or her become you know, a more efficient learner and not spend hours and hours and hours reading something or copying out notes when in fact they could be learning a more efficient way. And it's very important for all learning is motivation, that um, a motivated learner can be a successful learner. And of course, a successful learner is a motivated learner, uh, and the two go hand in hand. So motivation and looking at some strategies and some ideas for motivation is also very important. So, oh, I've gone the wrong way. So let's um, look at this learning journey. 
uh, understanding random differences, we're looking at you know the, the crossover or it's called comorbidity or co-association between different syndromes. Um, you no, know, you could find that with dyslexia, you could also have elements of dyscalculia, elements of auditory processing difference or difficulties, um, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, or attention difficulties. You could have an overlap of all these. Uh, in fact, the research, I'll, I'll show you in a second, the research shows it's more common to have an overlap than to have just, just dyslexia. And that's called comorbidity. And you can see there that the, the research, there's been quite a number of research studies indicating that the likelihood of two or, those, two or more of those learning difficulties can co-occur at the same time. So that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about maybe a child with dyslexia who could have poor handwriting to the extent that he or she is has got dysgraphia or could have difficulty processing numbers as well. And they might be in that dyscalculia uh, continuum. And usually, if you've got difficulty with anything, your attention will waver and they may well have some attention issues. And just speaking about attention issues, this is a, I always find this, it's from a book I read some years ago, but I find it really quite interesting that if, when you look at those very good, clear strategies from that book about ADHD, that children with ADHD, what, what you need to do um, with children with ADHD is to obviously listen to the concerns, avoid confrontation, play things down, avoid distraction, anything that's going to be distracting, provide reassurance, uh, make sure they complete tasks. It's, it's quite disheartening if you see a student with unfinished work in every page that you get a lot of satisfaction. And obviously, it's, it, completing something is what you want to do anyhow. So um, make sure that they complete tasks and scaffold the child's work so you build in steps to ensure that they are able to get that final question. If they can't do the questions because we haven't put in enough steps, so we could put in more steps. And uh, provide a clear structure for um, in the class that what they've got to do, they like to have a routine and so on. So that's for ADHD. Now, when I look at that, I say, hang on a minute. That could also apply to dyslexia. It's exactly what I would sort of suggest for children with dyslexia. And it's also suitable for dyspraxia and even the autistic spectrum. So really, in a sense, um, a lot of those strategies are genetic, that they can be very good for children with dyslexia, but also for other children. In fact, they can be good for children who don't have any of those syndromes, just for their good learning techniques. They're good for the learner in general. Right, let's move on uh, to dyslexia now. Um, so what is dyslexia? Dyslexia is essentially a processing difference, and that's what I was saying earlier. It's a difference in how these children are taking the information in. So that's the intake, just the, how they make sense of it, whether it's visual, whether it's auditory, or whether it's through touch or whatever, but whatever senses they experience. So that's import, very important for processing information. Um, so that's the input. Then there's a cognition part where they've got to think about it and try to put some meaning into it. Say, well, what does that mean? Have I read that before? Do I know about that? Can I relate it to previous knowledge? Is this new for me? How can I find out more about it? Where should I file it? And so on. So that's the, the cognition. Then there's the output. And that's how they demonstrate their competence. So it could be that um, they're not... Um, very good at writing, so but they may be very good orally. So it's how they demonstrate whether it's in drama and poetry and writing or in speech, how they demonstrate that they know that information. The other important thing is that uh, dyslexia, like most of the other syndromes, can be minimized through strategies and accommodations. 
I'm not saying, well, not, I'm not talk, saying the word cure because it's not really a disease and it's not really going to be cured, but you could live with it. You could accommodate to it through strategies and accommodations. Um, even smaller classes, for example, a simple thing like that. It might not be simple in some schools, but um, even group, group working in groups uh, can be very useful. But I'll be looking at the strategies and accommodation as I go through this presentation. Important point to make is that dyslexia is not related to intelligence. That um, there's a very low correlation, in fact, between reading and, and IQ. Uh, so, the, although I, I'm a psychologist and I do IQ tests as well as other things, but it's, I don't necessarily hang up in the IQ score. It's just a, a, really a number, it's an aggregate, in fact. I'm more interested in the IQ profile and the cognitive profile, because that could tell me something about the child's strengths and the child's weaknesses. And um, in some cases, it could be very in, in, insightful to find out that information. Um, discrepancies, you won't find, although we're not, a discrepancy definition is not really what we're looking for when we're uh, trying to diagnose dyslexia. The, it's important to note the discrepancies in the performances, whether it's with reading comprehension or reading fluency. Uh, they might be an accurate reader, but they may not have very good comprehension. Or they may be, have very good comprehension, but not very accurate reading. They may be uh, very good at math or science or art, but have difficulty with English. So uh, it's these are that kind of information is very important to know if you're going to try to include the student into the full curriculum. Um, it, dyslexia varies in severity, and we know that from very mild to very severe, and that's um, it's important to recognise that and to try to identify exactly where in the continuum to fall. And in DSM five, which is a diagnostic manual we use, it does actually act, you've got to categorise whether it's mild, moderate, or severe when you're looking at a specific learning disorder in reading, which would be dyslexia. Um, they can be creative, like I think outside the box, uh, not always, but I, I, I see hundreds, probably seen thousands, in fact, of children with dyslexia, and I've seen quite a number who are quite interesting thinkers, and they could probably think of things and come up with ideas that I certainly couldn't come up with. Um, and I think we've got to give them credit for that, and make sure they've got that opportunity to think outside the box and not pursue a very restrictive curriculum, but give them scope for that thinking and that, that more lateral thinking and um, just trying to look at learning in a, a different way. They may, they may usually, they, in fact, they usually have difficulties in processing speed. And that's because often they take longer to, you know, maybe to read or, or to understand what they're reading and then to say, well, what does that mean? That whole process, the whole learning, the cognitive process can take longer. And so they, they can have difficulty processing speed. And some of it could be through due to you know, lack of confidence as well. And they're maybe insecure. So they need more time to be sure of what they're doing. <clears throat> um, I mean, clearly in terms of dyslexia, it's a challenge in literacy, and that's the main thing, whether it's flu reading fluency, uh, reading comprehension, um, or, or whatever. But it um, usually it would be, re reading fluency is quite a key thing, um, because children with dyslexia will probably have more difficulty in reading very fluently. And that's got a spin-off with reading comprehension, because if you're not reading fluently, it will have an impact on reading comprehension. And they may have difficulties with working memory. And working memory, I think I might mention it later on in, this, in the presentation, but <clears throat> working memory is to do with, you know, keeping something in your head and doing something else at the same time. So for example, in, in many of the tests that some of you would use, it would be um, say digits backwards, for example. So they've got say digits backward, they've got hold a digit in their head, and they've got to try and rearrange it and sequence it 
into order. And they're just doing two tasks at the same time. And that's working memory. And that's quite challenging for children with dyslexia. Um, so I think I've just moved on. Yeah, and sometimes I use a kind of right brain, crudely speaking, a right hemisphere kind of way of thinking, which is very, very visual and aesthetic and um, need to get the whole picture. So you might want to start by telling them what the story is about before they start reading in page one. They need to get some context. And it's good learning strategies, actually, to get some sort of background, some sort of context before you start watching something or reading something that you know something about the characters and so on. OK, let's move on. So to, <clears throat> to summarize, <clears throat> It's a, a processing difference, really, that's what I'm saying. Secondly, it can affect code cognition, which is memory, speed, executive functioning, like time management, um, organization. <clears throat> it can be visual <clears throat> and phonological. Uh, you could, mainly phonological difficulties would be related to dyslexia, but some children with dyslexia may have some visual issues as well. Uh, there's normally some discrepancies in the performances, whatever that might be. You will see individual differences. So in some cases, you know, what might work for one student or for one child with dyslexia may not work for another. So you've really got to <clears throat> start with a child and start with their learning profile. Uh, that's why an assessment and a full assessment is so important to get the learning profile and to work out what kind of program or what kind of approach approaches they would need uh, and the context the environment is also uh, very important as well uh, so in some environment learning environments some children with dyslexia may not feel comfortable it depends on the school it depends on the context depends on the teacher even and obviously it depends on the materials so we've got to pay quite close attention to the context and to the learning environment. <laughs> and as I was saying earlier, and this is just a, some a reference to that, that dyslexia is not caused by general low intellectual ability. Uh, it, the general feeling is that phonological difficulties or phono something in the phonological area uh, would be one of the main causes and one of the main uh, characteristics of dyslexia. Okay. Oh, I've gone, I'm going to keep going back. Right, so now I'll just move on quickly because I've mentioned some of these <clears throat> earlier on. <clears throat> One thing I have to it, uh, metacognitive factors is thinking about thinking. And that's something we need to also be aware of when we're dealing with children with dyslexia, especially in an inclusive situation, that we've got to, to help them to become better learners. So they know their learning style, they know their own learning preference. And we've got to ask them questions like, well, how did you do that? And could you do, have done that a better way? And why did you do it that way? It's trying to get them to more under, understand more their own learning preferences. The reason for that is very simple, really, that once they could do that, then they can learn independently. And when they are in a big, say, a, a large school and it's very inclusive, then there will be more self-study and there will be more independent learning. So it's very important that they know how to tackle a, pro, a, a, a piece of text or a, a question or a problem. But they know what to do first, they know what to do second. So we need to pay attention to medical mission. I think I might talk with that later on as well. Another thing is automaticity. When we're learning anything, after a period of time, it becomes automatic, that you can do it without thinking. And that's also very important for learning because what it means is that we need to have repetitions, that to get automaticity, you've got to do it a number of times. And there is a quite a number of research program, uh, projects that show that children with dyslexia often take a bit longer to achieve automaticity. So well, some children could maybe get automaticity in this particular skill in a few weeks. Children with dyslexia may take a few months or even a few years. But it's important to acknowledge that they will need repetition. They will need overlearning. 
and that over learning obviously it could be varied you could make it more interesting it's not just sheer repetition of the same thing it's not rote learning it's uh, over learning which might be using something very visual but but tackling the same kind of concept, same idea in a different way, maybe through drama or through poetry or, or through even reading or reading to the, the student. So we've got to have a, a lot of different um, multi-sensory approaches in order to help to achieve automaticity. Okay, uh, so setting appropriate challenges was my second point I made at the beginning. And it's really all comes down to effective learning. And I've got four points here which are important for effective learning. And one is that independence, that for effective learning, we've got to try to see how we could help that student become independent. Because once a student is can learn by themselves, and that's been very important over the last few years when there have been a lot of students, I mean, children have been working from home, um, that once they're independent, they can work, know how to learn. That is actually, it gives them a lot of confidence. It also makes them a better learner as well. And they could learn things without teacher support. And that's what they want to do, really. <clears throat> they also need to have control. That they've got to feel that, look, they're doing this because they, it's because of their effort, not because they've got a buddy or because a teacher um, or because they're being, because of this sort of accommodation is because they are actually doing it themselves and they've got control over their own learning. And that also comes with choice as well, that they could have some choice over what to do and how to do something. And that makes them, well, in many ways, a more satisfied, perhaps even a more fulfilled learner. <clears throat> the strategy should be active and interactive. Um, active because children with, with learning differences would learn more effectively uh, if they're doing something. They don't learn too well by listening, that's using the auditory modality, but they will learn better if they're more active and interactive. But interactive means social, that they're discussing with somebody. And I always say to, when I'm speaking to parents especially, um, when I say to them, look, when you've got a student child at home and you're doing reading with him or her, You've got, it's important to interact and ask questions. Well, why do you think that character did this? Why do you think the author uh, put this in? Well, what, what does it add to the story? So getting them to interactive in terms of question and answer is so important for children with dyslexia, even at the beginning of the task. So they could have some, as I was saying earlier, have some idea or some context um, for, for the task. And it's also going to be achievable. <clears throat> If they feel they cannot do it, they won't do it. And then they'll say, I don't do this. <laughs> I don't read. I can't read, I won't read, and I don't read. Uh, so you've got to make reading achievable. You've got to see how we could put in you know, sufficient differentiation, uh, put in sufficient steps, and break those steps down into simpler steps and easier steps. So they can be achievable, because once you achieve one step, you can move on to the next one, and the next one, the next one. So you've got to make sure that the task that we as professionals, learners, uh, sorry, teachers um, and professionals, the task that we set for that student is achievable. And it's the onus is on us, really, to make sure the task is achievable, to make sure that we've differentiated it sufficiently so the student can achieve. Okay, let's move on. Um, so why do people why do people have different views of failure? It's because you know, they have different goals. So some ch children fail they, they, and they say, oh, I can't do this. I've, I've failed at this. Or some people could say, well, I can't do this, but maybe if I did this, I would be able to do it. No, they've got a different way of approaching failure. And <clears throat> it could be because they've got some goal, different goals. Some children could have achievement goals um, or performance goals, or some could just have a goal to, to finish the task. And if they can't finish the task, well, I can't do it. So it's important to try to set, I would say, individual performance goals so that they could set their own targets, not a target that 
a, a class target or a school target, but a tar or an age target even, but get their own target. Their own, look, you did this yesterday. Let's see if we could do this today. Let's see if we could extend this. So we're really trying to shift the whole aim of learning and try to create that performance goals um, rather than just say something to tick off the box or an achievement goal. <coughs> And I will, I'm really keen on this quote by John Hattie. <coughs> the kids who knuckle down and get the right answers don't always succeed. You may have achieved in getting great qualifications, doesn't mean to say you're going to succeed. <laughs> and that's why learning, the whole learning process is so important. So you become a good learner. So when you go, when you leave school, for example, and you go, when the student goes to a different kind of learning situation, but they know how to learn. They've got they work with a big company. The company director, or their line manager, gives them a company manual. <clears throat> got to look through this manual. They know how to extract the key points. That's what we want to do. We want them to be able to transfer learning from school to work or to university. Transfer learning from one situation, even at school, to another situation. So four key points here about uh, learning differences or dyslexia, we'll say. The differences are personal, which I've mentioned, that, that could be very individual. I say the assessment is dynamic, and that is that uh, you don't necessarily have to assess the here and now. You could do the assess assessment over a period of weeks or months. You could look at how they perform within the curriculum, That's as well as standardized tests. So we're looking at a range of different ways of assessing. It's very dynamic. Um, it's also educational. And I know there are other interventions, um, pharmaceutical, uh, psychomotor, all sorts of different kinds of interventions. But I think the, the key thing is that interventions can, and certainly if they're related to reading, they could be very effective. But what we're really looking at is what goes on in the educational paradigm, which is school for most children. So um, it's really ed intervention would be make most progress at school. And if there is out intervention outside of school, then there should be a link with school as well. And that works very successfully. It works here in Vancouver. Understanding is scientific, and that's very important. That, you know, but I, I've been in this field of dyslexia now, for um, over 30 years, well over 30 years. And, and when I first started and started teaching and lecturing about dyslexia, um, I had to really justify why I was there. I had to justify you know, what dyslexia was and whether it was a, a, a real entity. Uh, and now we know it is because we can see that with MRI scans. Uh, the understanding is very scientific. There's a dyslexia periodical, many of them in fact. Uh, and there's every day there's research papers coming out on dyslexia. So there's a very robust scientific understanding. Um, so we need to respond to young children's diverse learning needs. And whether it's dyslexia, and I've said dyslexia is a broad spectrum, or dyspraxia, or dyscalculia, or ADHD, you'll find that there's a, sp a broad spectrum there. And we each one of those children, with whatever they have, can be included. And this is, an, I'm sure some of you will have seen this the picture here, but this is in many cases, certainly when I was at school, this was the reality. That was me down here. Um, and then you've got equality, where they all got the same size of box. Okay, one for you, one for you, one for you. And then there's equity where, hang on, you're a bit small, so we'll give you two boxes, makes it a bit more equal. And of course, justice, when you take away the fence, take away the barriers, and they've got that open playing field. And what we want to achieve, of course, is inclusion, where they're in, totally involved. But it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's soccer, rugby, cricket, uh, games, sports, team games, individual games, but they are fully included, irrespective of whatever learning difference they have, whether it's dyspraxia or whatever, that full inclusion, that's what we're looking for. And we, I'll just mention neurodiversity because it's, uh, it's a very 
it's been a current trend and a current the topic for some years now. But it it's a good way of, although it's a, I mean, it's kind of quite general neurodiversity, but, you know, just when you break it down, it, it implies that the brain is very diverse. And there are probably areas, there are areas of the brain that we don't use because we haven't accessed them yet. Uh, and we could, um, we need to really ensure that, it, that we use as much of our brain as we can and not just the part that deals with what we, de- what we teach in school, which is really reading and writing <laughs> to a great extent. And that's why it's so important to look at that concept of neurodiversity and to appreciate what it means and how we could uh, uphold that and develop that in the classroom situation. That's actually very important for inclusion. So the the activity is difficult, the activity is avoided, the activity is not practiced. This is what happens with children with dyslexia and other similar situation uh, difficulties and differences that they might find reading difficult. So they avoid it and they don't practice it. And of course, we know that if you don't practice something, you lose the skill of doing it. It doesn't matter what it is, you will lose that skill. And that's what we're really describing here is uh, learned helplessness. And this is what happens with children with dyslexia when we don't ensure the sufficient differentiation, when we give them the same as everyone else. So in an inclusive classroom, clearly the key thing is differentiation. And that's still, they're still included, even though they're getting, they might not even be getting different work, they could be getting the same work, but just some children might need different means, different paths to get there, Uh, maybe many paths to get there, whereas some children might just need one path and they'll get there. But the, the aim, the idea, the work that they'll get at the end of the day is the same. Uh, And that helps to by putting in differentiation, putting in those different paths and these different steps, you're avoiding the problem of learned helplessness. Okay. Um, overcoming barriers. And I've kind of alluded to the different kind of barriers, social, emotional, classroom or curricular barriers and cognitive barriers. And we need to, again, address those. We need to identify those in the first place and then see how we could address them. And I'm, this is, if I was speaking to you in person, I would give you all a task and you're going to a little group for a few minutes. But you could actually just think yourself about the kind of barriers that some of your students may have in terms of social, emotional, cognitive, or classroom barriers. And um, we could anticipate, and I'm sure that you've thought about those barriers, that you could anticipate um, what kind of barriers a student with dyslexia may have. They're coming into an inclusive classroom, uh, say a second, a high school, a secondary school, and we know that they'll have difficulty with memory, like they have difficulty with social, maybe turn-taking, if they're very impulsive. Um, they could have difficulty with speed of working. Time pressures could put, make them very anxious, and they may well have difficulty with the organization and planning and um, focusing on that. So we know that they could have these challenges. And so we could actually try to be proactive, be proactive and put in some ideas and some strategies and try to tailor the curriculum and the materials that we're going to be using as a teacher uh, to try to minimize the impact of those challenges. And what I do, um, I developed this some years ago. It's an observational style identification. So it's really observation. And it's looking at children in different contexts and trying to find out, what, for example, one heading I use is emotional or motivation. And obviously, you've got to find what topics interest them, what kind of prompting they need to increase motivation. How, when are they motivated? Are they motivated by competition or not? Are they motivated by reward? Are they motivated by getting the job complete or the task completed? So trying to find out what motivates a student and what kind of incentives would be um, more likely to succeed. Um, then I would look at persistence. Can they persist with a task or do they need a lot of breaks? I find a lot of children with dyslexia would probably need fairly frequent breaks so they could work for some time and then have a break. Um, 
And that, that's something which is very important because, you know, it's a short five minute break. It doesn't have to be going out for a walk. It can be, but it could be just listening to a piece of music or just doing a stretch, stretching yourself and trying to reactivate the brain um, can be useful. Responsibility. Do they need to have that control? I was speaking earlier, a control of their own learning. To what extent do they take responsibility for their own learning? And uh, do or do they need to work with a buddy or a pal, or do they need to get a lot of teacher input um, or a lot of monitoring? So we need to find out something about that. Then communication. Do they just? I find I I do some, one of the tests I use involves um, me reading a story and they've got to tell me something about the story, and when you mark it when you grade it, it could be uh, the responses they give could be just random, just key points that stuck in their mind, or it could be sequential that they give the detail in sequence. And it's very important to record that whether a child has got that ability to retell in a kind of logical, sequential manner, or whether they just, they usually start with the last point you mentioned, but they're just looking at randomly. And that's something we could use for, to help with our teaching. If one or the other, if they're too general or they're, they're too random. <laughs> um, impulsivity is very important as well. <clears throat> and that's, of course, what's one of the factors, characteristics of attention difficulties. And some children with dyslexia can be quite impulsive. And that's because they may forget what they're going to say if they don't get it out. They've got to get it out quickly. And if they don't, then they may well forget uh, what they say. So that kind of makes them a bit impulsive. Uh, and physical mobility. And a lot of children, most children, need to move around, do they? Uh, nobody likes, even I don't like to sit still for too long. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're the same. Um, so it's important that they've got that scope, that opportunity to stand up, to move around, to get something, come back. Um, unlike when I was at school many years ago, where you had to sit down and say nothing and just write. <laughs> um, and it's important to get that physical mobility. And also in food and you know, having water or even the occasional snacks is quite important because that could actually give them that energy. We don't know if it's going to, maybe they've got low blood sugar for, for whatever. Um, so it's important to have, be aware of the time of day and Maybe they've got a preference for working in the morning as opposed to the afternoon or vice versa. And structure, children with dyslexia need to have a structure. In fact, during all the learning differences I mentioned, I would say a structure is important for every single one of them. Um, <clears throat> the, the, they've got to, <clears throat> it could be the structuring the desk or it could be structuring the brain and when, they're, when they're doing a, a piece of written work. You can say, right, let's work out what should come first, what should come second. Just trying to get the learning, they're able to learn in the sequence as well, as well as organize. Uh, and it's a good practice to be, to help them to become well organized. And some children, some people with dyslexia I know, uh, have become over organized because they know that left their own devices, they would have a difficulty with organization. So they actually overdo it <laughs> and they become hyper organized. And social interaction, and that's the whole that's the whole basis of the framework for inclusion, is that you've got that social interaction, which is so important. And it's become with children during the COVID period over the last few years, and children being socially isolated. I think everyone has noticed just the impact that can have on not just the child, but on people in general. Uh, and so it's more, it heightens the need for social interaction and full social action and a diverse range, diverse cultural range of uh, social interaction is the best. That's what we, that's the ideal. Um, now let's look very briefly <clears throat> at executive functioning. Um, a lot of children with dyslexia may well have difficulty with executive functioning. And executive functioning is almost like the engine of the processing part of the brain. 
where you're looking at working memory, you're planning, you're organizing, you're how you start a task, your attention, your focusing, and your emotions, your anxiety level. That could all stem from executive functioning. So it's important to look at that. And I use, when I do assessments, I use a test for executive functioning. And I pay a lot of attention to trying to get that right. I think it will get this right. And I could help with learning a great deal. And inclusion, <coughs> I could just move on. I mean, I said earlier, different, differentiation is one of the keys to inclusion. And it's very student focused, it's diverse, and it's, it's almost, it's inspiring for a child to be able to do the same as everywhere else, even though they do, a, do it a different way, but they still get there and their stuff still hang up and could put up on the wall with pride. Um, so this is my own <clears throat> um, definition of inclusion. <clears throat> it's a process accommodates to all those needs, <clears throat> educational, social, and emotional needs of children, young people and families. It's not necessarily being in a mainstream school, but clearly a mainstream school would be the main uh, avenue for an, an inclusive situation. Uh, but you could be included in different ways as well. So you could be, even if you're in a different kind of school, it could still be the same form of inclusion. And there are also social community inclusion as well. And so you could be, so it's important that, you know, it is important that uh, children are in a community, whether it's a school community or other kind of community, that they are not excluded. <coughs> and inclusion friendly approaches, <coughs> like uh, if you were a teacher and you were developing that, you would say use short sentences, uh, try to make the vocabulary within their knowledge that they, you know, keep it to their uh, what, what they can do or what they know. Um, <clears throat> try to provide definitions, even key. They're looking at a page of text. There will be a key. Oh, I look at this key and it tells me what to do next. <clears throat> spread out the text in the page and don't have the page too crowded. I mean, I'm looking at a, a, an article just now and you can see this by, oh, you can't see this. Um, I'm looking at this article and it's, the page is just crowded. I've got to really focus on it to find out what I want to read. <clears throat> so uh, really space out the page, use headings and subheadings and ensure that there's sufficient opportunity for background discussion with a friend or with somebody, um, in the class and that's uh, this, the what i showed you before that's inclusion friendly approaches and the individual model which would be it may not be inclusion friendly there will be children with poor organization they can't keep up with the class this is a, almost a deficit model <clears throat> so we want to avoid this my spell checker doesn't work um, they read slow, they can't follow directions, slow processing speed, forgetful. So these are things that, you know, I, I often see this when I look at <clears throat> background notes on children before I do an assessment. This is what I see. Uh, and that's very much uh, a deficit way of looking at it. It's, uh, that's the difficulties. So what I was suggesting earlier was looking at um, what we can do to eliminate these difficulties so they're not difficulties as such they're not really salient they're not important it's not important to keep up with class when we pace the learning so that everyone can do it at the same time or <clears throat> uh, make sure there's differentiation sufficiently so they can do it <clears throat> given printed notes so they don't have to write their own notes a whole school approach would be learning friendly environment additional support available um, different forms of investigation using YouTube, um, using drama plays, <clears throat> there's technology available. <clears throat> um, the differentiation of reality is not just something that's spoken about, but they actually do it. Uh, uh, staff have a high awareness, staff development, that they know about learning differences. Um, and they know exactly what we should be doing to deal with those differences and different kinds of assessment to try to gauge success 
So we're looking at not just written exams, but it could be oral assessments, could be projects, could be portfolios, looking at different ways of measuring competence. And that's what we need. And a teacher checklist that you might want to look at would be you know, have small steps been used, um, sentences short, the capabilities to understand. So I think I mentioned that earlier on. Have enough attention to presentation, font style. So looking at making sure that what they've got, what you give present to them is inclusion friendly. <clears throat> and of course that benefits all children. So for differentiation, we need to look at the task making sure it's achievable. We need to look at the outcome to demonstrate, so they could demonstrate competence in a, a number of different ways, not just through written work. Uh, we need to look at resources, uh, making sure that we've got sufficient resources that they could access something which is within their reading level or understanding level. And uh, additional support that could be a, a teaching assistant, it could be a buddy, a, it could be peer tutoring, it could be a parent. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, additional support. To support that differentiation to support the child in an inclusive situation. And as I said earlier, environment is very important. And I always think we're getting the classroom context, classroom design right is it's really important. I've been into so many classrooms in the course of my career. And it's been really interesting to look at how children perform in different kind of classrooms, whether it's shape, color, or design, it doesn't matter. But it will have an impact on learning. Effective learning stems from an effective school. So we're not really looking at one teacher or one child, we're looking at the whole school. And that's important to get the whole school situation and make it a whole school approach. <clears throat> and you could actually think now about What's an effective school? Is my school an effective school? What can I? What should an effective school have? It could be communication with parents. It could be inclusion for all, differentiation. It could be extracurricular for all, whatever. But for but you really need to try to identify what is an effective school. So there's twenty key principles here, which I'll go through quickly uh, for learning. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not, it's, it's still just after, it's almost eight o'clock in the morning. So um, I think my voice livens up as, as the day goes on. Um, I acknowledge all efforts, uh, and that's important, that you get praise not for getting it right, you get praise for doing it. And that's an important thing. It's the effort that you're rewarding. Okay, achievement, you get praise for that as well. But the effort is important. Because they could extend effort that it could do with other things as well. Individual feedback is very important. Um, and feedback could be in different ways. And it must be serious, it must be realistic as well. And you must say why. That's good because this is you weren't able to do this before, but you could do it now. Um, cater for all, and that's the whole crux of inclusion that you're catering for all. You've got to plan ahead. It doesn't just you don't just go in one morning and say, right, that's it. You've got to make sure that you know who you're planning for and to plan well ahead. And those plans will serve the need in the future as well for other children. You've got to anticipate problems, be proactive, say, right, I've got a child with a hearing difficulty, I've got a child with reading difficulty, so I'll need this, I'll need that, and I'll find out more about that. You've got to acknowledge their learning preferences. As I was saying earlier, uh, you, no, nobody is in isolation. That you need to consult with others, and so there's opportunity for that in a school to consult other teachers, or a, a year teacher, or whatever, or even the head teacher. <clears throat> Provide student choice, and children with dyslexia will react better if they've got a choice. It makes them feel important as well, and that's my last point there. Number nine makes students feel important, and then display students' work. Uh, multi-sensory teaching, which I mentioned, recognizing the strengths, which I've mentioned, working with families, that it's important to have that link between school and home. That's very crucial for inclusion. And you know, I know that parents could provide so much support for, to a teacher and vice versa. So it's not just one way, it's two way. And positive reinforcement, uh, as opposed to negative, reinfor negative reinforcement, but, Positive reinforcement is that you're praising and that you're 
every time they do something good, you're praising, or even if they do something, it doesn't have to be good, you're, you're reinforcing that behavior that you want to develop. Uh, you prepare extension work, because as I said earlier, some children with dyslexia could be high achievers, and we've got to make sure they get that opportunity to achieve to a high level. Um, you've got to respect individual cultural differences and, indi <coughs> and individual differences. And that's also important. And cultural differences are very important. And people learn a lot from other cultures. Uh, not just learning about your own culture, but learning about other cultures as well and sharing. <coughs> and classroom routines, providing a routine for the classroom <clears throat> is also very, very important. And it's really, if, especially for, say, autistic children within the autism spectrum, that they need that routine, but so do children with dyslexia. And, you know, a lot of children react better to a routine. I've left three others, uh, 18, 19, 20, for you to think about yourself, because um, I'm sure you've got your own individual views on this. <clears throat> motivation, I'll just quickly move on with motivation. <clears throat> Um, setting goals, they need to have, well, what, why are they doing this? That's it. Many children ask that question, in fact, which I certainly wouldn't have asked when I was at school, but children say, well, why am I doing this? What's the purpose of this? So you've got to show why children are doing it and give them goals, that, to do it, give them short-term goals, which are achievable, and that will lead to a long-term goal. The school ethos and the school climate is very important for motivation. And it's also very important, as I was saying earlier, to prevent, prevent that learned helplessness by being proactive. And extrinsic motivation would be praise and intrinsic would be that they do it themselves because they want to achieve and they feel it's important. And that's what we want to aim for. We want to aim for that intrinsic motivation. And the motivating environment, so that's what I was saying about the whole school approach to motivation. It's also very important. And to summarize, um, encourage <clears throat> empower learners. I think it's very important that they, they make, to help children with dyslexia feel important, that they are important in the learning process, they're important in the group work, they're important in the classroom. And also to encourage independence by empowering them, to give them that confidence they could do things themselves. To acknowledge their individual needs. So we've got to find out, first of all, what their needs are. That's why an assessment and assessing the needs is crucial. Um, organizing and understanding effective learning. What do we mean by learning? What do we mean by effective learning? How can we make learning more effective? It's not just to do with memory, it's to do with learning. It's the process of learning. How to put the tackle first, what to do next, and what to do after that. Consider the learning environment, uh, developing a positive school ethos so that they feel that they want to go to school. <laughs> Even if they're not able to read very well, they still want to go to school. And it's crucial to have home school links, very important. And also very important to embrace diversity and differences, whatever these differences are that they should be embraced and they should be included and they will be enriching for all. And I, I like this quote by a friend of mine called Tom West, who's an author in the United States in Washington, DC. And he wrote the book, In the Mind's Eye. And he says, we ought to be, be, begin to pay less attention to getting everyone over the same hill using the same path. And I think that's very important, that there's different ways of getting there. We may wish to encourage some to take different routes to the same end. Then we might see good reason for paying careful attention to the descriptions of what they have found, as we may wish to follow them someday. And what that means is that, you know, people with dyslexia could think of things that we haven't thought about. And hey, they might be better than what we're thinking. We might want to do what they're doing. And that's why a lot of big companies, especially computer companies, they want to hire people with dyslexia because they could not just replicate what's gone on before, but they could invent new things, they could develop new products and solve problems which we didn't know were problems. <laughs> new problems that occur all the time, they'll be able to do problems. And that's why it's important to, you know, to ensure that we're looking at not just replicating what we're doing, but giving them that opportunity for lateral thinking and thinking outside the box.
No, this is my second last slide. Um, so that's, um, I notice I've got on the shirt, same shirt today as I had on that picture, but I can assure you I've got more than one shirt. Um, and that's my last slide there. And that's just some of the more recent books. These are all in the last few years. Um, and we've got one just, uh, I don't know if it's good. No, it's not there. Um, just coming out yesterday, the 21st of January it came out, which is a few days ago, or for parents. It's a parents activity book, which I did with Jen Clark and Michelle McIntosh. Uh, it's a, a published by Jessica Kingsley in London. And that's a, a, a book for parents. And I think it's very important that, you know, we have got activities and materials for parents, especially nowadays. It's crucial that learning takes place at home as well as in the school. So thank you all very much for watching and listening. And I'm happy to take some questions now as we've got time. We'll run a bit late because we're late in starting. Okay, thank you very much. So crucial and impressive speech covering clearly and innovately key issues of the topic learning differences in an attempt for teachers to address the needs of all in an inclusive school environment. We found very attractive and functioning your points on a number of issues related such as the meaning and the positive side of learning differences and the ways of addressing effectively to them the meaning and dynamic of assessment for promoting learning, the promotion of an inclusive learning environment and the whole, the whole school involvement in enhancing it, the encouragement of diversity in children's learning preferences, the crucial role of self-belief to accomplish um, any degree of success and motivation, the use of uh, group work effectively, the develop uh, of uh, student responsibility and choice, the use of positive feedback and the celebration of learning success, the need for active and effective learning and its common strats to follow some key factors for success, etc. I think that all of the above remarks and points uh, in your speech and slides could made, uh, uh, made by Dr. Uh, Gavit Reed would be a very useful guide for teachers working in inclusive schools. Let me now, Dr. Gavit Reed, to address uh, some questions uh, just related to your speech. The first question is, uh, do you think that uh, the most appropriate uh, term to use is uh, uh, learning differences or learning difficulties? Well, to be honest, they're both appropriate um, mm -hmm. in a sense because children with dyslexia or dyspraxia, it is a difficulty. Let's be honest about that. It is a difficulty. Um, that and we know that, but it's important that I use learning differences because although it's a difficulty, it's only a difficulty because of the context that we are in a, a educational context where reading is important. So if it's all to do with reading, then they have a difficulty. But it doesn't have to be to do with reading. There's other ways of learning. There's other ways of doing things, and they could be very good at other things. It could be good at, say, doing drama or plays. So it's, from that point of view, it's not a general difficulty. It's a specific difficulty. But that's why I prefer to use learning differences, because it could be very good at something and not so good at something else. So uh, it's either a specific learning difficulty, specific mm -hmm. to reading or specific to that, or it's a learning difference. Um, but I think the danger of using the term learning difference, I mean, is, I, I like learning difference because it's just a different way of learning for them, is that people might say, oh, you, so you don't have any difficulties then, when in fact they have. So and in many ways, I think both terms were interchangeable. And I've, I've used them in this presentation. I've used both terms interchangeably. So I don't think it's one or the other. 
I think we could both be, be using them. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. Uh, another question is uh, just uh, uh, could you uh, tell us some more about effective learning and effective schools? What's the relation between them? Yeah, well, effective learning um, would be what happens in the classroom and how you help a student become a better learner. Now, so if the classroom situation is one where the child's taking notes all the time, they're not learning. But if it's a problem-solving classroom where they're going to investigating, if it's an investigation kind of classroom, then they will, they will be learning. So it's going to be more effective from there. If they're problem solving, they're investigating. So clearly, the kind of learning that takes place in the classroom is very important for effective learning or ineffective learning, whatever it might be. But what I'm saying, a lot of that comes from the management of the school. Because the management allocate the resources for problem solving activities. They allocate the opportunity for field trips. So it's, although what goes on in the classroom is important, it's also important to consider the whole structure of the school, the ambience, the ethos, the, the motivational, motivational factors of the school, if it's a welcoming school. I mean, all these things would be motivating for the child and therefore they would be more effective in their learning and how they learn. So I think it's both are important, but clearly for okay. effective learning, we're looking at the classroom. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, another two questions. Uh, we know that uh, there was a movement in the uh, UK about dyslexia-friendly schools. Mm -hmm. And also, we, uh, you uh, <clears throat> referred in your speech uh, uh, on uh, inclusion-friendly approaches. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? Um, What's the no, relation yes. between them? Yeah, I would say they're very much the same because if you look at dyslexia-friendly approaches, one of the points that they make in dyslexia-friendly approaches is that these approaches are good for all. They're good for dyslexic students, but they're also good for every student. When you look at some of these, the, the checklists, we look at British Dyslexia Association, and they've got a, a booklet on uh, dyslexia-friendly. And if you read through all the different items and points they make you you say well that would be good for everyone so if it's good for everyone then it's inclusive friendly as well so many <laughs> ways they are the same um except you know we're look uh, for inclusion friendly you're looking at a broader range of syndromes not just dyslexia you'd be looking at autism you could be looking at children with hearing impairment or visual impairment and so on. Mm -hmm. so it's a broader scope, inclusion friendly, but the the main thrust would be the same, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last question is a double question. Uh, because uh, you visited a number of uh, uh, countries all over the world, do you think that uh, dyslexia is a universal uh, thing? and also is reversal under some conditions reversal oh. just to to cope to cope with uh, with it right uh, well it is universal i mean I, as, a, as you said I've, it is universal yes i've been uh, in many many countries i think over 60 countries talking about dyslexia and it's they have the same challenges there in some languages, it's more pronounced than in other languages, depending on the, the, well, the English language, for example. Um, it, it's not very dyslexia friendly, put it like this. Um, but every, every country, every language would have students with dyslexia. It's, it's, you know, and a lot of the challenges have to do, some of it to do with the school system as well. And I find that the, that can be universal as well. Uh, or the challenge of trying to include children with dyslexia or learning differences in the mainstream, that's, we find that in we say, of the same arguments, the same issues, the same barriers in every country. Mm -hmm. So you're not alone there. <laughs> what, was the second okay. part, what was the second part of the question? Uh, uh, if we can uh, cope with dyslexia uh, just uh, for a child, 
uh, to be, uh, um, let's say, in a later age without dyslexia? Uh, as they go older, do they they don't have dyslexia? Yeah. So you've got a child with dyslexia as when they're seven or eight, and when they're eighteen or nineteen, they probably still have dyslexia, but they'll be able mm -hmm. to cope with it better. They'll be able to because they've got more strategies as they develop, go through school. That they'll have more in the same with adults. They'll have more strategies, so they'll be able to cope with it. But there will be still some situations that will put them under pressure because they're dyslexic. Uh, depending on the workplace or the, the university, but they've got all these books to read. Um, so they, they, and that's, I don't talk about reversing it, but they will be able to cope with it much okay. better as they get older. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much uh, for all uh, your answers. Uh, before ending, uh, let me give some information uh, about upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, I mean, in uh, uh, the coming three, uh, three months, on uh, 10 of February, Professor Robert Horner from uh, uh, the University of Oregon with uh, uh, a speech, and the title of her, his speech is School-Wide Positive Behavior Support, an Introduction to Core Futures and Documented Outcomes. On uh, 30 of March, uh, Professor Michelle uh, Weymeyer from the University of Kansas, and uh, the speech uh, will be with the title Inclusive Education in a Strengths Based Era Mapping the Future of the Field. And uh, the third webinar uh, on 13 of April, Dr. Lynn Fuchs uh, from uh, the Waterbeat. Waterbilt University in USA with uh, the speech uh, addressing the role of language comprehension in world problem intervention to improve outcomes for children with learning disabilities. And uh, uh, let me end uh, this uh, event by uh, noted that a recorded version of this webinar will be made available in our website www.unique.ac.cy uh, uh, edu series 2021-2022. At this website, you can find more information about those to come and also watch the previous webinars. If you would like to be kept up to date with the series, please sign up at the bottom of this uh, web page and you will receive notifications of the webinar. Again, I would like uh, to thank very much uh, Dr. Gavin Reed for uh, his uh, uh, present uh, presentation and uh, the cooperation with the University of uh, Nicosia. And also many thanks for all the audience of this uh, speech. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll uh, have again uh, Dr. Gabby Reed in the near future for, uh, with some kind of uh, different speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.